Good evening, everyone. We're just going to give everyone a second to get logged in while we wait. Um, get settled and introduce yourself in the chat. Thank you so much for joining everyone. We'll just wait one more minute while everyone gets settled and then we'll start our feature presentation with Dr. Allison Clark Afford. Thank you so much for being here. All right. I'm gonna stop my screen share so I can see my notes. Um, okay. Good evening and welcome to the Milwaukee Public Library Book Chat. Each month we focus on a different theme and occasionally bring in guests from the public. My name is Beth and I'm the adult librarian at the East Branch, which is over on North and Kramer Street. Hopefully I can see you in person sometime. Joining me tonight is my co-host and esteemed colleague Kelly, who is our programming librarian. She'll be hanging out in the background. Um, feel free to drop any questions that you have in the Q&A box as we go along. We'll have some time at the end to address those um, technical questions can also go in there and Kelly will help you out. Um, you can also use the chat box to interact with each other, say where you're from, books you recommend yourself. Um, as always, we invite you to sit back and relax. Um, you don't need to take any notes or anything. We'll provide you with all the links, book recommendations, and other great things in our follow-up email in a couple of days after the program. We'll also send you a recording link if you need to duck out early. All right, so without further ado, I want to introduce our special guest, who is Dr. Allison Clark Effort. Um, she is a historian of immigration to the United States during the 19th century. She grew up in New Zealand and moved to Wisconsin to take a job at Marquette University, which is where I met her. Um, she is now a proud Milwaukeean and believes in the power of reckoning with difficult history to improve our city. Welcome and thank you for joining us on Book Chat. How are you this evening? Thank you. I'm feeling great. I'm thrilled to be in invited to talk to you in particular in particular Beth and but also yes. I am a huge Milwaukee Public Library fan so this is a real honor <laughs> that's awesome um what is your normal branch I always have to ask everyone who comes on where you usually go if it's more than one that's fine we're not really I'm a central person I, awesome. I really like central because it's close to work for me my office mm -hmm. is very close um to central because it's on that end of the Marquette campus and I really like the um the humanities room, the 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 microfilm. I have to yeah. say, and <laughs> and I have a um an eight year old son who loves the children's room. So, um, yeah, it's central for me. That's awesome. It is probably the most amazing building I think yeah. personally yeah. in Milwaukee. It's really fun, and um, just so everyone knows, Central has recently reopened a lot of the rooms, including humanities. So I hope you can make it down some time to visit. Um, they are open Sundays now for brief hours, which is great if you have um, parking issues, free parking on Sundays. So check that out. I know the children's room, they were really happy to get that back open for people to enjoy. So definitely come visit and say hello. <laughs> so tonight we're here to talk about your work, um, especially your book, which we'll jump into in a second. But I just want to touch on your bio a little bit. So you grew up in New Zealand, um, but what brought you to Milwaukee specifically? Was it just the job at Marquette or have you been here for other work? It's a bit more complicated than that. I would have to say I, I need to develop a better narrative of my own life, I think. Um, <laughs> my, my, my mom, my mom was born in the US, but she's lived in New Zealand since 1971. So since well before I was born, but I got US citizenship through her so I feel very lucky in that regard um, and I traveled after high school and I met the guy I ended up marrying and I went to university in Texas and then I got my PhD at Ohio State in Ohio um, and then I came to Marquette so um, it, it, it's a it, it is there's definitely been sort of stepping stones along the way um, I would say though it's kind of, I really feel as in some ways as though I've come home. Milwaukee really suits me. Um, and now I have sort of a Wisconsin kid, um, mm -hmm. who will, you know, be out there playing basketball in temperatures below freezing. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's home now. 
That's great. I was going to say, I met you at Marquette. So for everyone listening tonight, I was Dr. Efford's TA when I was in graduate school at Marquette. Um, you were my first professor to do that for, so it was really great. And I TA for your U.S. history class. So that was... And that might have been my first year teaching, I think. I think so, too. Uh, I, so I, I think of, that... I have learned a lot since then. Um, <laughs> so I thought you did a great job. <laughs> I was like very impressed I love this class I love sitting in your class and I very distinctly remember you telling the students um that we were talking about the American Revolution and leading up to it and you're like I think it's kind of an unjustified revolution and they were like oh. <laughs> I love that moment so much and it's very much in my brain it's a really good memory <laughs> that was somewhat tongue-in-cheek I am a big fan of the Declaration of Independence uh, but it's nice to kind of mix things up especially with U.S. history where students come to university kind of thinking they know um, and so I sort of try to do things to get people to look at history through new eyes um, Absolutely. I think you really accomplished switching the lens, which we always talk about as historians, um, which I always appreciate. And then why immigration history? What drew you to that pursuit specifically in your work? Um, partly it was my own experience of getting to know the United States. Um, it was, but I was also quite aware of the fact that I am white, I am a native English speaker, that I came with citizenship, and it, I just, in all these ways, I'm so privileged, and my story of immigration is unusual, but that was sort of something I wanted to look at too, I think that sort of like immigration cuts across um, race um, and, and class and gender um, in, in these interesting ways that only highlight their importance, right? Only highlight the importance of, of, of race and class and gender and other things. Um, and I wanted to kind of explore that, explore immigration and, and whiteness um, and, and how sometimes white immigrants get involved in um, structures that marginalize and exclude other immigrants and other people. Um, so in Wisconsin, for example, white men from Europe could vote before native born black men and before any women. So um, just Wisconsin law meant you didn't have to be a citizen um, to, to, to vote in, in the state because that was when Wisconsin was a Western state of the United States. They really wanted to attract more people. Um, so that's just, I think it just sort of makes you stop and think. It's, it wasn't even citizenship that mattered. It was those, those lines of race um, and gender. That, that mattered. That's so fascinating and really ties into your new book here, which is called, I'm going to try to show it, everyone, um, my background is blurry, so it's not always the best, but it's called Radical Relationships, the Civil War Era oh, Correspondence. My yep, book, might. Show it. Yeah, I do have flag in too. <laughs> in a funny way, too. Um, <laughs> um, the Civil War Correspondence of Matilda Franziska Annika. Oh, wow. So, um, I'm just going to read the brief little description so everyone can know what we're talking about. If they haven't read it already, I encourage you all to do so. Um, the volume presents edited and translated letters by the important German-American abolitionist and suffragist featuring her intense cohabitating romantic friendship with Mary Booth. Um, beyond that, do you have any elevator pitch for your book, any background that you would quick like everyone to have before we talk about it a little more? I have to shout out my collaborator. So I worked with Victoria Billich, who is a professor of translation over at UWM, right? So very Milwaukee. Um, and, and we worked together to, to edit and translate these letters um, by Matilda Francisca Annika, who was, I kind of hope everyone has heard of her, but maybe that's not realistic. For a time, she was the most important woman suffragist in Milwaukee and she ran a girls school and she was an abolitionist she was a German American so her letters were in German <laughs> and she really never liked speaking English so so she wrote German language letters and then she had this we're calling it as you said an intense cohabiting romantic friendship with another woman um, and one of the sort of big questions I think of the book is 
how would we characterize this relationship? Like, is it a lesbian relationship? Is that kind of the right way to explain what this relationship meant to these two women? Um, and, and that's, I think that that's a really interesting kind of thing to explore. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And just reading some of the letters between them, they were very intimate and very like the names that they would call each other, even within the letters. I was like, wow, that's very romantic and very <laughs> emotional. And could I read one out? Would you yes, let me read please. one out? Say, yes, please, please share your fame. <laughs> <laughs> so this is from Mary Booth um, to Matilda Annika. Um, and it was written in 1862, right? Just so with Civil War era, just getting everyone oriented. Um, pardon me, my dear, for writing you such a miserable little note saying I was an unhappy. I am indeed very happy when I think of your sweet love. It glorifies every even and illuminates the darkest midnights. You are the morning star of my soul. <gasps> Um, the beautiful auroral glow of my heart, the saintly lily of my dream, the dark, the deep dark rosebud unfolding in my bosom day by day, sweetening my life with your ethereal fragrance. Dearest, you are the reality of my dreams, my life, my love. I have no more sorrow. I have you. Um, so yeah, I run away with her. <laughs> like, wow. Thank they were very effusive. I mean, and that was one of the kind of cool things about this project was um, that they like to put their, their feelings on paper. Um, so it, it was, um, yeah, I, I like to say this should be a movie, right? Like they, they just, it's all out there. These very personal feelings and these tensions um, are, are on the page for us to share with people. Mm -hmm. It's just so effervescent and pervasive and then just tracking back a little bit to the translation um you include in the book some scans of the letters and what they look like and I was like oh, like that's why there are two of us like I mean <laughs> I can I mean, we 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 brought brought sort of particular skills I I'm a historian Victoria is as a professional translator but also we kind of needed each other when we when the handwriting we're like oh this handwriting is so hard to read um, it oh was really gosh. good to have some to be working with someone else when it kind of got stressful and you couldn't decide you know should we translate it this way or that way to have someone else you could lean on and discuss it with was really I mean, I can imagine or just being like, do you think it's this, the handwriting? Because honestly, like I, as a former teaching assistant who got an eye twitch from looking at microfilm for, I worked for Father Vela too, and that was in English. And I was like, oh, I can't even imagine transcribing those letters, like typing them out. Um, and then I learned about for the first time ever, current shrift. Can you tell everyone oh, what that true. is? It was, yeah, it's it's this 19th century form of handwriting that they used when they wrote German. Um, and so even German speakers today, just it just they formed letters differently. It's very sort of idiosyncratic. Um, so yeah, sometimes we would have, you know, 10 emails back and forth about a single letter, about what letter do you think this is? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it was taxing. <laughs> With a K. Someone asked how do you spell it. It's it's one word and Corbent is with a K. Or I can um, copy so. it. Or are you typing? <laughs> it's the teacher and me. I feel like yes. I wrote it down. I was like, we need to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I loved how um, interspersed in the text was, you know, images and some images. Like, I loved the one of both of them sitting together. Um, that was really great. Um, I have one slide that when we go into the book recommendations, I have a picture of um, Matilda. I will show her one so you can see her. And they posed, um, they posed to have that photo taken of them together. And it very much to me looks like the sort of a picture a couple would have taken of them. Um, maybe, I, I don't know if this kind of interrupts the flow, but um, Matilda, they were both married to men. Um, mm -hmm. So they meet in Milwaukee right before the Civil War. Um, and at that point, 
Matilda, um, Matilda Francisca Annika, um, her husband goes back to Europe um, to, to, to work as a reporter because he was having trouble earning money in the United States. And Matilda moves in with Mary Booth and her husband Sherman Booth, who was very famous um, at the time. He's the most prominent um, abolitionist in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and he was on trial all the time for his involvement in um, the Joshua Glover affair, getting um, a man who had escaped slavery, making sure he could get on to Canada. Um, so, so Matilda moves in with, with um, Mary. And at that point, she writes to her husband and sort of says, yeah, we're just friends now. Like we're co-parents, we love each other because we have children together. And so she was always writing to him about the children, but she said, we don't love each other like lovers. And, and so she's, it's very clear she's still married to him. She still has a relationship with him. She still has his last name. Um, but he really feel like she's shifting her attentions to, to Mary Booth. Um, and then the following year, she and Mary Booth take three of their children um, and they move to Switzerland and live together. So they, they have a household unit that is two women um, and three children and a maid, <laughs> which I think would be useful, but um, right. yeah. That's awesome. Um, and that was her second husband, correct? Because she was yes. married twice. Yes. And um, I remember the first husband, wasn't he on, he was either convicted or on trial for something pretty. He wasn't, there wasn't a trial so much. I think, let, let me get this started. For her, so Matilda's first husband, she grows up in a part of Prussia um, and she grows, off rel grows up relatively well off. She gets a good sort of private education and she mixes with kind of interesting um, educated people. But then her family falls on hard times and they did essentially marry her off when she was 19. The guy she married paid her family money so they could pay off her debts. Um, but then that guy turned out to be, you know, drank too much and was violent. Um, so she had a baby and she was sort of extracting herself and her baby from this marriage, which was very hard. She wanted custody, but it was hard to get divorce and, and custody rights. And that's really what made her into a, a lifelong feminist. She just didn't think it was fair that women could sort of be subject to, to the whims of men who could turn out to be violent and abusive. Um, and, and Mary, Mary Booth had a similar thing with Sherman Booth. It's a it's a little bit more complicated because both women respected him as an abolitionist, but he was charged with, quote unquote, seducing a 14 year old who was over to look after the kids. Um, my reading is that it was rape, that it was forced intercourse, but they had this sort of the law on the books that they could use when they didn't think that there was quite enough force for it to, to, to meet their bar for, for rape. Um, and Mary and Matilda thought he did it. And that was part of why Mary left. Um, he was, he turned out to be a real jerk. <laughs> yeah, I that really has drove home to me. They're similar background with these complicated relationships with their spouses and the danger and the fear, let alone the danger and the fear from their radical views and the work that, you know, especially Matilda was doing. Um, when you started this work, were you specifically aiming to write about Matilda or did you kind of start somewhere else and my first book is on German immigrants and race and citizenship in the Civil War era. And that's sort of where I met Matilda. Like I heard about her as an abolitionist and she had been, she fought in the German revolutions in 1848. So there are pictures of her riding a horse wearing trousers um, from those revolutions of 1848. And so I sort of started getting into it there, but there's this huge archive in Madison of the Wisconsin Historical Society that's all in this Korenschrift. Um, and I just, 
I knew it had interesting things in it, but I didn't have the time to go through it. And then when I met, met Victoria, when she came to UW Milwaukee, we were sort of thinking, oh, we should do a project together. Um, and then this seemed like the perfect project. And then originally we thought, oh, we'll translate all of the letters. And then we realized, oh, wow, there are a lot of letters. And also it, gets, it would get a bit boring to have like absolutely every letter. So... Mm. <laughs> it was one of those things that happened by steps. We 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 ended up taking sort of six narrow. years, yeah, six years, and even selected um within those years we select sort of interesting um, letters, and that was the length of um, the relationship with with Mary Booth. So it has a very clear sort of narrative arc from when they meet to the sad ending. Mary no. dies. Mary dies. Like, <laughs> Spoiler. No. Yeah. And I mean, Mary had also eventually she moves and she remarried. Does she marry somebody, another, or she's with another man? I, there sorry. are other men around. I think this is interesting too. I think my read today is if they lived today, that Matilda probably would identify as lesbian or perhaps bisexual. I, I have more of a question for Mary. She, she kind of had all these male admirers who she whose admiration she appreciated. She always managed to kind of have these, these friends around her. Um, yeah, so they were living in Switzerland and Mary was sick the whole time. She had, I, I um, not that sort of doctor, but I would diagnose her as having epilepsy and tuberculosis. And I think it would, the epilepsy really scared people most, but I think the tuberculosis was what killed her. Um, anyway, so they're, they're in Switzerland, in Zurich, with the kids, but Mary thinks she's going to die, and so she goes back to the United States um, to get medical treatment, which was really not, I mean, pretty kooky medical treatment, the things they thought that they could do to help. Yeah. Um, but she also wanted to see her other daughter because she had left, Mary had left one of her daughters in the US. And if she was going to die, she wanted to see her other daughter. And then she died. She died the same month that the Civil War ended. So I think this, I mean, it has to be a movie, it's right? Like, it, it has to be. This storyline. You couldn't, you couldn't make it up. <laughs> no, you absolutely couldn't. And um, long time viewers of this program know I'm a big romance reader and reviewer so like this really drew me in um, like that way and I was like we need a really awesome historical fiction adaptation of this yes. it would be amazing and then we'll get the movie rights and yep, do it. yep. <laughs> you and me right we'll do it <laughs> yeah, we'll do it let's do it <laughs> um let's see I really liked talking like thinking about um how 25% of the Union soldiers were born outside of the United States for the Civil War. That was something, I think I knew it inherently, but I didn't think about it. So that was also something you brought up um, in this book a little bit. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, and of course, Wisconsin is a very German place, and the Germans were one of the groups that was sort of overrepresented um, in, in those numbers. The Irish um, immigrants tend to be slightly underrepresented, and then um, there were a lot of sort of Brits and Canadians um, and Scandinavians um, who were in there um, too. I... It, <laughs> It's interesting in the book, you see a lot of the machinations with these Germans, especially the Germans who aspired to leadership, the, the German officers. Um, and they're sort of, sometimes they're kind of like re-litigating or refighting the battles back from 1848. Um, they're, they're kind of all these sort of recriminations of, we could have gotten a republic in Germany. They never, they never did. Um, they, they, yeah, Prussia beat them back. Um, and there is there's sort of all these the sort of posturing um, and ambitions and Fritz Arnica, so Matilda's husband Fritz, he was a colonel in a Wisconsin um, regiment, um, and then he jumped around a bit. But he so he came back. He had been in Europe, but he came back to fight in in the Civil War, and he ends up. I don't know. I find it, <laughs> I don't know what to do with Fritz. He seems sort of like a bit of a doofus. Like he he really thought he had been in the Prussian army. He really thought that he 
he knew how to fight a war and why weren't people like respecting him and giving him more responsibility um so he ends up um he, he ends up court martialed court martialed basically because he didn't get on with his commanding officer he couldn't kind of like bite his tongue when he had to um he he thought he knew better and he he was got he wasn't gonna sort of hold back um so he he ends up getting court martialed and kicked out of the army which is um I don't know, sort of a little interesting side story um, that, that comes up. Um, and, and Matilda was sort of embarrassed, I think, because people knew that they were married and she was sort of, a, she was, they were both sort of public people writing in newspapers. Um, and it's kind of like, she's just, there, there are places where she's like, just, uh, I, I, I can't remember the, the wording of it, but sort of like hold it together. This never helps. You get you get all worked up and it, it comes back to bite you. So yeah, and she was right. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Oh Fritz. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Um so yeah, I I don't know. This was just really engaging to read. I love reading letters and I, I liked how you kept some of their like misspellings and you know the little idiosyncrasies of the language that they use between them and um you said there was a archive that you used in madison that had the letters was there any other really cool stuff that you found either here in milwaukee at mpl or that other collections that you were using to do your research um we did do a research trip to germany and switzerland of course so we did find some neat things when we were in zurich um so some of the pictures come from our time in zurich and just sort of nailing down what neighborhoods they lived in in zurich and getting a sense of yeah what it was like to have lived there and they're really into they're really into sort of i, I think of it as very kind of like a, a middle class childhood they, they didn't have much money but they really wanted you know birthday celebrations and Christmas celebrations and trips and let's let's go on a hike up um the close by um mountain um and and then sort of day trips or overnight trips and I mean that sort of appealed to me kind of as a parent it's kind of like yeah those are the sorts of things you do with the, your kids you try to make these little occasions and, and kind mm -hmm. of these it, it's um, and when you're in Zurich, you can, there's the lake and there are the mountains and you can sort of imagine what that was like. Mm -hmm. um, and so we gathered some, some um, sources um, local in, in Zurich and a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of footnotes that you don't have to read, right? Like they're totally optional. No one has to read the footnotes, but um, they um, give you kind of context. If they bring up a name, so like, mm -hmm. yeah, we explain who that person is. Um, mm -hmm. And so we used, um, we used newspapers at the library <laughs> um, and, and various other sources to kind of fill in that information. Um, and some of that, yeah, sometimes it's one of those things where it took, you know, it took days to kind of work out that would, what was going on. And we wanted mm -hmm. to make sure that the reader wouldn't be totally confused by what was going on. You accomplish that for sure. Um, speaking as a mom with little, a little, you have a son who's smaller, and I found an article that you wrote um, that talked about your work on this project along with um, your experience parenting during the pandemic. And I will include a link to that when we email everyone. But do you want to talk about that article a little bit, talking about your pod? parent and how that kind of reflected back on this book here i was i was so lucky we we potted with um a family who has a kid um in in my son's class so we could sort of with four parents and two kids we almost survived <laughs> you know like there was there was still a reasonable amount of stress but you know trying to um kind of get the kids they, they were six and seven at the time now seven and eight and just sort of making sure that they kind of stayed on task and engaged when we were when it was all over zoom when um education was all over zoom um was quite a challenge and i just i i was i just felt so lucky um to to have um Jolyn and Abby and James um it just so there's my shout out um 
and it was a sort of unexpected relationship, right? We knew them, right? The kids were friends, um, but there was something about sort of being in and out of each other's houses. Um, and, you know, the kids like, you know, read a book and they might sit in your bed and read a book or, you know, you have all these kind of very um, close um, interactions. And it's, it made me reflect on the nature of Matilda and Mary's relationship. Um, my relationship was not like their relationship, but mm -hmm. it sort of made me think about today we sort of tend to have a kind of very firm line between romantic relationships and platonic relationships. Mm -hmm. they're, they're sort of distinct. So the term that I use for Matilda and um, Mary's relationship was a romantic friendship, which might even sound like an oxymoron to someone, you know, mm -hmm. like how can it be romantic and be a friendship that there's, there's somehow a tension there. Um, but I think, I, I think that it's kind of interesting to think ourselves back into the 19th century when they didn't feel like that was a tension, right? Like they didn't have to say, we are straight or we are lesbian. And I, 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 think, I think if I had a relationship like that, there would be some sort of pressure. If, if, if my relationship got that close, there would be some sort of pressure to define it one way or, or, or the other. But I, I think they really, they felt, they knew they were married to men. They didn't feel as though they were doing anything that should shock people. And yet they wrote these really intense letters and they created a household without men, which allowed them to do things that they couldn't do with their loser husbands. Um, <laughs> both of the husbands, like, I don't have much time for um, in, in the book. Um, so, so if you read the article or the, or the little essay that I wrote, it's, it's sort of reflecting on those things. It's, it's sort of thinking, wow, friendship can be really intense. Friendship can be more than a sort of like just friends. You can get excitement. You can get kind of not just sort of comfort and support, but also like excitement um, out of um, friendships without them falling into that category of, of, of uh, a sort of a, a same sex um, sexual relationship. So I was sort of playing with that line. I think it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about it ever since I read that. And, you know, I'm a parent too during these times and like reading articles where, you know, even single women have bought houses together and they're forming these you know, I'm hearing the words like intentional communities and folks that are, you know, forming more, if you're stuck in the gender binary family structure, seem unusual, but maybe weren't as unusual, aren't as unusual as we even know, because here we have evidence of it happening in the past. And if these two women are doing it, who's to say there weren't many others as well. And we just don't have their letters preserved because they weren't doing this work they were doing so I yeah think. and this historians sort of know that that women had very in, intense friendships in the 19th century and then there's sort of this back and forth over how to to describe that um, and I suspect some if they live today would identify as lesbians and and that and and then some just would really use this effusive language um, and, and that, that they are, that it was more what we would think of as sort of intense um, friends um, between people of the same gender, um, friendship between people of the same gender. So, yeah, I mean, I think even if you don't, even if you're not someone who is going to reorganize your life, I found mm -hmm. it, I personally, it made me rethink, working on the book made me rethink a lot of my interactions and relationships and I think sometimes people don't think of relationships as something that would have a history right but they mm. really thought differently about relationships and I think that I find that kind of a little bit um 
like it's sort of mind bending. It's like, wow, mm-hmm. right? Like, how could it be? I think of these things as so natural. Um, it's sort of like it's the way things are. But when you sort of look at these other ways of having relationships, it sort of forces you to to reconsider things. Absolutely, and even. I've been reading articles about, you know, friendship breakups and how that can be more traumatic than a divorce because of, depending on how long you've been friends, you might, or how intense your feelings as friends are, we don't have as much support for that sort of breakup from each other. So well, even in the modern- those links. I, there have been some of these interesting things. I think there was a there is a bit of a sort of movement to talk about these things. There was a story in the um, New York Times about two women who described each them, themselves as best friends, but they were going to get married because that mm-hmm. seemed like a, a, a sort of useful unit for them to have. Um, mm-hmm. I, it's a very interesting discussion. Um, yes. All these thoughts I'm having now and everyone should read it and then join us in our thoughts <laughs> um let me see we're coming down let me just go through my questions um before we jump into our book recommendations um I always have to ask to how public libraries have shaped you as kind of a reader researcher educator growing up do you have any fun library stories to share either from back when you were in New Zealand or you know when you were younger or even now favorite memory oh good stories I just libraries have been so much part of my life forever um I would need to think to come up with a a, a great anecdote because I do I mean I do so much of my work in libraries mm-hmm. and a lot of my sources are and you actually have to go to the library and stay there to read the my yep. they don't let you leave <laughs> all, all the rare all the all the rare books um or the yeah it's a various different things so it's been real libraries have been so important um in in my work life and then I also, I like novels um, and I like audiobooks. Um, and yeah, I'm not so into ebooks. Um, I would rather get the hard copy um, if I can. Um, and then just with my son, um, I, yeah. I bet if I have a good story, it would come out of that. It would, it would, it would take place. It would be set in the children's room at Central. Um, but I'm not <laughs> I'm not coming no, out you're from, you're just, I, there's so many <laughs> yes. um he was so into the trains um oh, I, yes. and I have it I have some cute photos of him like throwing a tantrum when we had to leave the library which used to really amuse the adults I think but like my kid <laughs> didn't want to leave the library and was prepared to throw a tantrum over it um and we did so during COVID, we got used to doing it using the app. I love the app. Um, mm-hmm. I have to say, like, if anyone, <laughs> if anyone doesn't use the app, like, um, it's very what's, good. what's the name of the app? You probably my phone. Away. I call it the County Cat app. Yeah. And then I just got so used to finding a book I wanted and county cat mobile um mm-hmm. and then just Get on your phone. ordering it and saying yeah I'll pick that up at drive through I'll pick that up at drive through um so we got kind of used to that and I really appreciated the convenience of that but then when we went back to the library I realized how much we'd been missing because I think I often got books that I I tried not to do this, but I think there was a little bit of should, like, this is a book I would like you to read, <laughs> eight-year-old mm-hmm. boy. Um, and then when we go to the, the library, he can, you know, get Whatever. the books that appeal to him and, like, sort of grab them off the shelves. And, yeah, if you want to read, you know, four um, of the sort of bad kitty comics, which I can't stand bad kitty comics, but the kids love them. Um, they do, but, they really do. <laughs> <laughs> then it's sort of like go for it and you can sort of see the series and kind of like grab the next one um and also ask the librarians right like so like oh my kid likes this what other book might might he like um or sort of Mm -hmm. see the new book displays and um sort of just end up kind of grabbing little treats Um, the element of discovery isn't as great when you're just 
putting something on hold, you know, that's kind of how I felt too. And missing just being able to browse and seeing the displays. And I know at Central, they always have those great displays as you're going into the kids' room and it's just like, wow, I want one of each of these. <laughs> so that's so sweet. I love it so much. Um, and then before we turn over to our book recommendations, what's next for you? What's project you're working on currently? I <laughs> <laughs> it feels like a very this All feels like my, my my supervisor asking me <laughs> kind of like how are you making no pressure the next book? um I'm actually on sabbatical next year 2022 mm -hmm. 2023 and I'm going to try to get a full draft of my next book done which is on um immigrant emotions um and particularly looking at um suicide um some some days I wish I had not chosen that topic, I have to say, um, but it's a, it's a highly documented act, right? As it's yes. very, it can be hard to get at people's feelings, but um, coroner's inquests and newspaper stories um, sort of have sort of give me a window into, uh, into this, this, into people's real trauma and challenges um, and struggles. So I'm looking at yeah, immigration, immigrant emotions and, and suicide around 1900, sort of before and after. I'm trying to get a bit away from the Germans. They'll still be Germans, but I'm trying Absolutely. to bring in other, other groups as well. Well, I wish you the best of luck on that and not too much heavy feelings because that is heavy oh, yes. that you're doing. Um, yeah. All right, um, let's turn over to our book recommendations. I'm gonna have Kelly pull up the slides for me. Just wait one second. And then just a reminder, if anyone has questions, you can feel free to pop those in the Q&A. We will um, go through them after the slides and the book recommendations. Um, next slide, Kelly, please. Um, these are the two pictures that I wanted to just make sure to show everyone. So this is Annika um, becoming a prominent force. And I pulled um, that first one from the Encyclopedia of Milwaukee, which is a really cool resource that everyone can access online. And then um, the one on horseback is the one from the book. Do you want to say anything more about the photos? No, I, I, I think that's, I think that's good. Um, so yeah, the one on horseback was her in the revolutions of 1848. And I, that's sort of how I imagine that German Milwaukeeans, um, that's how I think they thought of her um, around 1860. And she was quite famous um, and quite well known. And then she had a girls school in Milwaukee. So sort of among German Milwaukeeans, people would have known who, who Matilda Annika was. That's awesome. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so part of book chat, we pick a theme. Obviously, this month we picked women's history, and I asked Dr. Effer to pick some books to recommend to you. So why don't you go ahead and um, tell everyone what you chose? I should say that I tried to choose things that were a little bit away from kind of like heavy um, academic history, um, but things that I also think have important ideas. So things that are... Um, accessible and very readable um not maybe not quite enjoyable because <laughs> some of these um deal with um difficult topics um but but definitely accessible so the first one here um danielle mcguire's at the dark end of the street um which is about black women um and it Black women and sexual assault and how important that was in motivating the African American civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. So many of us, I think, have an idea in our head of what that sort of classic, classic Black civil rights movement was in the 1950s and 1960s. But this shows that actually white men attacking black women and the way that black women rose up in resistance against that was a really important motivator. So someone like Rosa Parks was involved in um, rape investigations um, as part of her work with the NAACP before um, the Montgomery bus boycotts. So, and, and then you see all along how this is a 
theme that is getting particularly black women and also black men motivated to, to demand um, civil rights. And it's, it's just, it's, it's really well written um, and, and, and sort of change the, changes the way you think about the 20th century um, in the United States, I think. The second one, The Buddha in the Attic by Julie Otsuka um, is actually fiction. So it's historical fiction, but it is, it is very well done in terms of there were no sort of places where I sort of thought, eh, I'm not sure about the history here. And usually, I mean, like, that's what I do is I, <laughs> I usually read historical fiction and say, nah. I, I find it very hard to read historical fiction generally because I can't turn off my historian's mind. Um, and she, she, she talks about her research at the, at, at the end, there, there are a few pages. It, it focuses on picture brides from Japan. So these are women who had married um, Japanese American men in abstention um, by picture and then traveled to the United States to meet their husbands. Um, and so they were immigrating to the United States, but in this particular gendered way. And it's written in the first person plural. So it's written saying, we did this, we did that, mostly. And then there are sort of breakouts, which, I don't know. If you read the Amazon reviews, I think it really ticks some people off. Some people cannot handle like the we um, narrator. But for me, it, um, I don't know, it makes you think about kind of individual identity versus communal identity. It makes you think about those tensions between this group and, and, and the individual. And it's very, it, it's, it, it, it maybe sounds like a bit much, but it's really accessible. Um, I assign this to, to some freshman students who, um, yeah, most of them I would say find that it's a really interesting way into Japanese American history. And then it ends with um, the internment of, of Japanese Americans in World War, World War II. And then um, the body is not an apology. Um, this is by Sonia Renee Taylor, and it's nonfiction. Um, and it is really, I mean, the subtitle says it all: the power of radical self-love. The idea, the the idea that a lot of kind of a lot of prejudice and kind of marginalizing of people comes about comes from our feelings about bodies. When you stop and think about like race and gender and, and sort of ableism, um, a lot of that is about how we respond to our bodies and the, <laughs> the bodies around us. Um, and she is really particularly sort of from a um, that activism point of view really kind of pushes us to have radical self-love um, for our bodies and see that as a route to kind of like ex accepting is not how she was put it but like a, a, a powerful sort of force for change um, that sort of how we accept our own bodies can be part of how we imagine a better world. Um, and I'm not doing it justice. It's also very accessible. Um, I, I have to say this is a sort of a bit, the sort of book that I might think that I might not like because it's a little bit self-helpy, but I actually found that it, it was one of those books that made me think about the world differently. It's sort of, and I haven't seen, and she's not an academic. I haven't seen an academic make those arguments as powerfully um, as she makes them. Cover is just so striking to me. I've had that one on my list for so long and I'm bumping it right up to the top. It's our oh, quick read. You do it, do it. Yeah, yeah. I'll do it. <laughs> motivated. <laughs> That's what this program does to me. I'm like, I gotta read all these things because you all have such great recommendations. Um, thank you. Um, we can go to the next slide, Kelly. 
Kelly, did you want to turn your mic on and talk about your pick? Um, Kelly is our programming librarian and she was recently featured on WUWM. Um, she leads our Climate Action Book Club, which is super awesome. Um, I help her with that sometimes. And soon we're going to be reading All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. Kelly, did you want to share? Yeah, thanks, Beth. I'm happy to be here tonight. So, so yeah, this, um, as you can see, is a um, collection that's edited by Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson and Catherine K. Wilkinson. Um, it is a collection of essays and poetry and art um, that are written by women in various fields. So you've got like scientists and activists and even farmers um, that come together um, you know, around the common cause of looking at the climate crisis through the lens of, um, you know, whatever their field is. And the goal of the collection is to create a much more nuanced uh, perspective on, you know, where we are um, in battling the crisis and solutions to it. You know, I think a lot of these conversations tend to be dominated by men, especially, you know, in, in um, the sciences. And um, there's one essay in particular that really stood out to me that was written um, by someone who uh, writes from the viewpoint of being a mother. And you know, she talks about how, um, so she's a climate journalist and she talks about having to balance the um, sort of looming climate dread from you know, her work in reporting on you know, what's happening and trying to maintain positivity for her kids. Um, you know, and, and her ideas of being a good mother, but also, you know, um, enabling them to uh, make informed decisions, you know, as, as young people growing up in the world as it is today. Um, and there was another essay in here too that I loved by Adrian Marie Brown um, about emergent strategy. And her premise is talking about how interconnected all living things are in the world. And it's just such a such a beautiful um, and humbling perspective, uh, you know, when you think about the um, the day to day impacts we have on the climate and our choices, you know, as consumers, um, and the things that you know, even when things feel really overwhelming, you know, with how big the problem is, um, there are um, changes that we can make in our own lives. Um, you know, pressure like we can put on you know, big oil and you know these these really mammoth. Um, uh, uh, entities in our world that are causing the bigger catastrophic change. You know, there, there's always things that we can do as individuals and more importantly, um, things that we can do collectively. Um, so, so yeah, we're really excited to read this on Monday. Uh, we'll be meeting at 6 p.m. for the Climate Action Book Club. Um, we will include our registration link if you'd like to join us for that discussion in our follow-up email. Um, it's a really great group, but we're always um, welcoming to new people as well. Um, Kelly, you can go to the next slide. So um, as part of our program tonight, I wanted to include some recommendations from a woman that I really admire. It's my manager at the East Ranch, Enid. Um, she has been my manager for many years now and has exquisite reading tastes, which our patrons at East just love. So she wanted to recommend these two to everyone. She couldn't be here tonight, so I'll read her um, quick sentences. Um, the first one is Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls by T. Kira Madden. And Enid says this is a debut memoir that you will not be able to put down. It's got a vivid account of growing up in the 90s in Florida with sharp and alive prose with glamour and deprivation, loss and addiction. Um, the author has an absentee white father who is married to another woman while her mother is Chinese American. And reading her story you will become aware that you are in the hands of a literary master. So definitely check out that memoir. And then her second recommendation is Men We Reaped by Jasmine Ward. Um, Enid said this is another masterpiece. Ward writes about the conditions that caused her to lose five young Black men that she loved in a period of a few short years. Among them was her cousin and her brother. Growing up in poverty in rural Mississippi creates certain disadvantages and bad luck for young Black men. The men died too soon, and she writes about them with warmth and love, bringing them back to life again. Um, thank you, Enid. I hope you see this when we post the recording. Um, you can go to the next slide, Kelly. 
All right. Um, so tonight, these are my recommendations. My first one isn't actually a book. I cheated a little bit. This is a documentary that you can watch by putting the DVD on hold um, at the Milwaukee Public Library. It's called Val Phillips Dream Big Dreams. Val Phillips is a very, very famous and important Milwaukee civil rights activist. Um, she has achieved an impressive list of firsts as part of her legacy building, including being the first African-American judge in Wisconsin, the first woman and African-American in the nation elected executive office in state government. So Phillips also used to be um, a patron of the East Branch Library where both Enid and I work. So I, we would definitely suggest that you watch this really amazing piece on PBS. Again, we'll put the pulled links in that email for you. Um, I just got this one, so I haven't read the whole thing, but I've been flipping through it. It's a very brand new book. It's called Carolina Built by Kiana Alexander. It is a historical fiction novel about Josephine and Leary, who is a woman determined to build her own life and a future for her family. So we follow her on her journey from North Carolina, from the plantation where she was born, to becoming free, newly married, and ready to follow her dreams. Um, this is a really, really beautiful cover that I immediately, I picked it up off a shelf and I was like, yep, I would recommend this one. And the prose is just really exquisite and accessible. And I recommend it if you're looking for something that is fiction during these this month. And then my last pick is called Radioactive, which is about Marie and Pierre Curie, but mostly Marie, let's be honest. And it's a tale of love and fallout. And what really draws me into this one is that it's an illustrated text. So the author used this really cool photography slash radioactive material technique to make art include with the book, which talks about Marie Curie's work and also the impact on um, what is it? radioactive elements and radiation and how that has impacted the modern world. So really how her work has continued to impact us today and how her work also led to her untimely death. So it's just a gorgeous piece. When you get it, it's a really big hardcover book. So just be forewarned if you do put it on hold that it is, it's a big one. And it's just absolutely glorious. And I love to flip through it and reread passages. Um, we actually did a book to art club discussion on this one a couple of years ago where we did some similar techniques, not using radioactive materials because they wouldn't let me do that at the library. <laughs> All right, um, that ends our book recommendations. I just have a couple more slides. Um, Kelly, if you wanna go to the next one. We are proud partners of Milwaukee Film here at the Milwaukee Public Library. Um, this film has already been um, streamed, or not streamed, has aired over with Milwaukee Film Fest Women's History Month, but we were a partner of the Real Women Have Cur Curves event. But check out um, Milwaukee Film's website to see more great opportunities to see films that they are showing um, during the month of March. And then we will be partnering with them again for the upcoming Milwaukee Film Festival, which is happening sooner rather than later. All right, next slide. Um, you can also check out really great resources we have on our website at mpl.org. Our librarians have come up with um, book lists that you can use to put more materials on hold. And then I have to just brag about our new subscription to Canopy, which is an amazing resource. Um, it is a film streaming service. So with your Milwaukee Public Library card, you can stream films. Um, like these that are featured for Women's History Month. They have things that we don't even have on DVD yet in the collection, and there's just such great selections. Um, you can actually download the app right to your smart television if you do have one of those, or you can stream it on your computer or your phone. You do need to be a city of Milwaukee resident, so do check that before you try to sign up. Next slide. And then just to wrap us up, our next book chat is April 12th. We're going to be talking with special guest Rashad Howard. You might know Rashad as a father, entrepreneur, and community leader. He was born here and raised in Milwaukee. His current branded business is Cream City Print Lounge, which is a retail print shop where you can come in and print your own apparel. He is one of Milwaukee Business Journal's top 40 under 40 for community leadership and has won many awards. And um, he is working with the Bucks, um, printing a lot of their apparel for the new stadium that we have here in Milwaukee. So I'm looking forward to talking to Rashad. We will include a registration link if you'd like to join us. 
Um, all right, Kelly, if you, you can turn the slides off now if you like. And then um, let's just see if we have any questions. Doesn't look like any questions, but a few people have recommended some books that they're reading. Um, Lisa just picked up Woman by Lillian Faderman, starting it soon. Looks like Dr. Effort is pretty sad with that one. So awesome. Any final thoughts or words for us? No, thank you so much. I love talking books. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. I'm so glad you were able to give us some of your time. I'm so appreciative. Thanks so much for being here. It's been great catching up and we hope to see you soon either at Central or maybe you'll come visit me at East sometime. All right. Well, have a great night, everyone. Check your emails in a couple of days for that follow-up and we will see you next time. Have a good night, everyone.